We have a very special treat this week. We're giving you a behind the scenes, inside look at the Impact Arts and Culture Conference. It's held by the Cultural Alliance of York in conjunction with York College. And what it does is bring together amazing artists, keynotes, speakers, and demonstrations from across the country to share with the regional artists here the business of art, how you can impact and create and shape your community using the power of your creativity. Culture and me. It is a place where the truth should be kept. The arts and music scene really shows what people are about. Share what's going on here in York. It makes you feel like a family. Local art has a face that most people can relate to. Our community up here that sticks together. Art is art. Great potential with great artists, poets, singers, writers, directors, filmmakers. It's fantastic. Everyone has a story to tell. That moment, you have to capture that moment and share it with the rest of the world. Showing something that maybe has not been seen before. Without art, what is this life? I am art. I've been art ever since I was born. It really adds a great deal to our community. We don't really need art to exist, but you need art to live. Culture in Maine is important, and I think playing out is important, and playing open mics and playing wherever you can play. It's all about us all checking in with each other. Now, our keynote speaker is an amazing woman who is inspired by her own nieces and young people that are around her, the female people. And she speaks about using females and arts and crafts activities to inspire these young people and help make technology of the future today. The 2015 Impact Arts and Culture Conference is pleased to present Girls Go Digital founder, artist, Rachel Ramsey. extra loudly like I do in my university classes. So hopefully you'll, you got a little bit of information about me from the program uh, and maybe you'll indulge me a little bit. Um, I kind of inserted a, a, a little bit of personal stuff into this because it is very personal to me. Um, it may look or you may have thought that it's about computer science and tech but it's really about something that's much more than that. And so if you look at this idea, um, I, the main idea I have here is the idea of dis disruption by design. So this word disruption, we hear it, and it has certain connotations. I want to define it for you so that we can all get on the same page. Uh, if we define disruption, it is, a, let's see, I think I'm hitting my mic, um, a disturbance that interrupts an event or activity or process. So hopefully that sounds like a familiar term for disruption. Then I also want to define design. So design, purpose or planning, I feel like it's a very active word. Um, it, design isn't necessarily about what, one type of thing. Um, I am a graphic designer, but recently I've renamed myself to just a designer because I feel like I've started to enter into other spaces that aren't in um, a print or a visual form. Uh, this idea of design can be applied across all different types of media. Um, so just, just kind of think of that um, as the design naming in here. So we think of disruption, and I was even, I was at the Martin Library, um, and you sit in their quiet reading room, and they've got these signs, and they call them a non-disruption -disrupt room, something like that. And so we think of disruption as being really mostly negative. Um, we have ideas, or um, we have things that happen to us in our lives that are negative. Um, so maybe it's what, when you were seven, and you were in class and you were drawing a picture of a tree and the child next to you said, that doesn't look anything like a tree to me. And so what happens in your mind? You go, crap, I can't draw a tree. <laughs> I'm terrible at this. So then maybe you stop trying to draw trees. 
So that would be a negative disruption. Or it could possibly be something a little bit different. Maybe it's when your fifth grade teacher tells you that you'll never become an astronaut. That, now that one could be a little bit more powerful because somebody who, who you trust tells you something and you believe them. You're in that age. So there are, are these negative disruptions, but I also believe that we can take disruption and make it a positive thing. Because if you think of it uh, of something uh, that it that it's something that gets inserted into your life, um, why not there be positive things? So a positive disruption might be when your yearbook teacher in high school says, "You know, you did a really great job. You worked really hard. You should think about being a graphic designer." And then the, the kid who didn't think that they really wanted to go to college or be involved when found some place where they could learn more about graphic design. Or when your seven-year-old niece is uh, working with you on a project and you're experimenting on her and she finds success and she stands up and says, I'm an engineer. I never thought I would be an engineer. <laughs> Positive disruption. We all know that in education, the first things that get cut are often the things that can make it worth going into school every day. Now this next workshop talks about reaching underserved communities through arts education. Those underserved communities can be anywhere and everywhere, economic, racial, urban or rurally based. But the bottom line is art inspires, art changes, and art actually helps make you smarter. Check it out is reaching underserved youth through arts and education. Arts and education, based on the presentations we're about to hear, is when you're putting a professional teaching artist, and many of you are in the room today, a professional teaching artist, whether it be theater, dance, music, visual arts, putting that person in a classroom or community setting, in today's presentations, primarily classroom settings, um, and you are providing those students or participants with an authentic art experience. We can find a way to link the arts with the academics. And I think for those arts, uh, teaching artists in the room, for those of you who are arts educators, for us this is a no-brainer. We know that the arts are at the core of education, that they support learning in every one of our core academic content areas like nothing else. But we do have to prove that and, and as a result, our artists and our teaching artists must, must, must be really up to speed in terms of what's required of them in a classroom. So we deliver a lot of professional development and our professional development we find is not siloed. We love to bring teaching arts together with classroom teachers, with the art teachers, with arts administrators, so that everyone's on board about benchmarks and what we expect and what student learning outcomes we're expecting from our residency work. So that having been said, arts integration, we hear arts integration, arts infusion, it's all just words. It's how the arts and the, the concepts and skills that we use as art makers can be connected to the skills and content that we learn when we're learning the additive process in math or literacy skills in reading and writing. Um, and it's not, it's not a, a, a concept, it's, it's, it's a real pragmatic way of looking at how the arts can in fact be linked to the academics. Um, this whole concept that there was a mandate for the arts, it's like smoking fire right now. I mean, it, it's crazy. I mean, to hear the things that I am hearing on a daily basis about testing and about, and the almost the eradication of the arts, not the implementation, not the, not the bringing together, but this separation is making me nuts. Uh, and I've got to say that we, time after time, and by the way, this is Laura Dietrich, state of Laura and say hi, who's our executive director. She is a teacher in the Harrisburg School District. She has been an incredible implementor S made it up, um, to bring in, you know, wonderful, uh, so many different levels, that's what we have to keep hitting, so many different levels within this, the school and, and how to, 
how to inject and get some traction um, it, it's really it's been a challenge but the point of this is that every time we do this we get those kids who are the troublemakers who are the kids who are you know the, the, the ones that are you know separated the ones who probably are on the, the track of trouble and we bring them into the arts especially dance and they have an opportunity to get that energy, refocus that energy, reshift that energy, and become something positive. And we see it time after time. Good Arts Integration is a 50-50 weaving of the arts and another content area. You should not be able to unweave that. The arts should elevate, let's say, social studies. The social studies curriculum should be elevating the arts, learning in both areas. Develop an affinity for arcade games. This game is called Whack-a-mole! You think you've got it nailed down? Wrong! Another mole appears! Pothole! Ah, uh, maybe there's a rainbow at the bottom though, or, you know, a pot of gold. An equitable system of funding our schools so that the poor get equal access to the arts. Thank you very much. That's it. One of the hardest things for most artists is actually getting their own art out there. We want to create, but we need grassroots advocacy and other ways to make our voice heard. And we now can find out how. We're here to talk to you today about um, some of our grassroots arts advocacy strategies. Um, I'm going to talk about um, a rally that we had uh, several years ago um, and how it impacted um, the funding for the arts. And um, Tracy's going to share more uh, about the initiatives that they're doing in, in Massachusetts. Um, our mission is to work with artists, creatives, entrepreneurs um, to ask for what we need in the creative community and to build more resources and support. Um, so we're a political organization. We're not affiliated with the state government, but we work very closely with our statewide um, agency that provides arts and cultural funding. So if you're um, talking to your legislator about making sure that there's more public funding for the arts, you can just talk to them about the value of the arts and they, be, they may be convinced just on the merits, but 99% of the time there's some other political influence at play. <laughs> really? <laughs> really? Shocking. Um, so you need to tap into what actually influences them so that they can do nothing else but side with you. Arts aren't seen as essential, they're seen as an add-on. So if you look at arts education, um, like in Massachusetts, there's a bunch of requirements for what the, um, like a high school student needs to graduate, just like there is in Pennsylvania. Um, there's math, there's science, there's English, there's foreign language. There's a recommendation for one year of arts, but it's not required. And so if it's not a tested subject, it's one of the first things to get cut. And it's seen as something that's an add-on, it's a special. Um, we wanna change that and say that arts aren't just nice, but they're necessary. Um, and then um, thinking about uh, the conversation this morning, um, it's not that, um, if you aren't good at math, you can't just stop taking math classes. But what happens like after eighth grade is that if you're not good at art, you're like, oh, I'm not good at that, so I'm not gonna take it. And that we totally need to shift, right? We're not allowed to quit math, cl math classes. So you shouldn't be able to quit art classes. It should be something that you have to work at and that you're bad at, but you can get better at. It's not just about talent, it's about skill. Um, it moves us from thinking about art for art's sake to art for community sake, um, is how art matters to vibrant communities. So, you know, part of the reason why I live and work in the place that I do is because I feel like a part of the community there, and I'm sure it's the same thing here, um, is that arts helps to revitalize communities, it helps to um, in, input value, um, and it connects, you know, connects our communities. It's, um, this is the thing that resonates a lot with people who are making decisions, right? Because it's all about what, what, how am I serving my community? What is it that we need? We call the grass tops and the grass roots. <laughs> um, so if you think about grass tops, um, you know, it's the people who have a little bit more power to their name. Um, so people who have direct influence over the governor or over a city councilor. So maybe 
um, the local fire department or their best friend or their um, advisor. Um, that's like all in the, the grass tops level. And then in the grassroots, it's just like the everyday citizens. So we use both of these tactics. Citizens for the Arts has annually on FC Day in May, where we talk about um, budget related issues. And um, I've got a copy of the, the policy agenda that we developed for that. One of the things with this, this whole um, rally thing was that we realized that the arts could, doesn't exist alone. We needed to partner with other organizations that um, have a cultural component. So now Citizens for the Arts advocates for arts and culture. So we work with the PA Museum, we work with the PA uh, Pennsylvania Arts Education Network, uh, Pennsylvania Humanities Council, um, the other groups, um, and then our regional advocacy organizations in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. So we all work together to develop legislative policy agendas, to work with legislators on developing policy. Uh, you know, cultural tourists um, spend more in every study um, than do a regular a regular tourist because we tend to do things like go to the movie, I mean, I mean go, go to dinner, um, buy things, um, I guess we're big trinket buyers, um, and, and you know, uh, hire babysitters, things like that, and we take those things into consideration when we're talking about the economic impact. But um, those are two very important um, studies that Americans for the Arts does. It's on their website, these studies are on their website, they're also on Citizens for the Arts website. We could probably all use a few tips on how to keep our brains sharp. But creative aging is a really dynamic emerging new field about using creativity and interaction to work with senior citizens and to encourage senior citizens to enter into the dialogue, share their wisdom, their experience, and their stories so that we can learn from them and help at the same time. And if you do this, and if you dance, and it, no, just have them dance once and watch everyone laughing. Or have them come in and play intergenerationally and watch. You don't have to convince anybody of anything. They know it. We know it inside. So it's about equipping us to help people remember what they've forgotten. The brain doesn't just stop when it runs into the old wiring. It rewires around it. So as it does apply to aging populations beyond a certain marker, or as it engages um, brain injury, Parkinson's, at whatever age, that these will change. We certainly have critical mass at this time. Uh, we have uh, more than 44 million older people in our society right now. So that's 14% of a po our population, or one in seven in general, are already over the age of 65. Um, in Pennsylvania, it's higher than that. We're second in the nation. Do you all know that? We're second in the nation in terms of proportion of older people. Urban Palmore is in his 80s now. Um, I don't know if he uh, is really into creative expression, but I do know that he's into embracing age. Each year on his birthday, he bikes the number of miles as his age. Uh, he does the number of deep knee bends as his age, and he does the number of sit-ups as his age, and he does the number of push-ups as his age, somewhere along the age of maybe 79 or 81, I can't remember. Uh, he had a biking accident and broke his wrist before he finished uh, his full 79 or 81 miles, and so we tacked that on to the following year. You know, <laughs> so uh, he, he's tough as nails, but that's what this picture represents. Um, the, the lady on your right is the same, the, the essence is the same when she's that young person. A young person goes through the life process, you have experiences, your basic personality traits tend to remain stable and strengthen over time. Your experiences will shape and mold you. 
the core essence of who you are is always there. And for those of you who have already experienced some uh, external changes to your appearance, you know, you know, you have this internal image of yourself and occasionally you get that external view and it can be quite shocking. Because <laughs> inside yourself, you walk around thinking. You know, I have uh, one PowerPoint that I share with my students where I have this uh, picture of myself when I was their age and I was doing an oral history interview and you know, I was 22 years old age and the first time I showed it, they didn't know who it was. It was me with my grandparents. I just put it in there because I said, you know, we were doing the same thing. They are like, who's that? I was like, oh. <laughs> shame, shame, shame. We have a chance to sort of recognize and think about the possibilities and to reshape this time of life and think of it as a positive time of life, a time for growth. The reality is, is the growth is there, is the potential for it is there. We need to sort of shift and begin to expect these things to happen in our later years. Uh, there was a resident who came to our community who uh, painted and had, had that passion was still alive in her. And she was feeling a little bit discouraged because um, she really couldn't share that anymore. I mean, you know, there wasn't anyone in there per se that, that was an artist. And so that, that part of her kind of closed down a little bit. And the only thing she was she could do was kind of when people visited her, she would show the paintings that, that she had done. Well, once again, you know, I built a program around that. And it was like, um, you know, I knew a nurse who uh, was an employee. She was an art teacher as well. And she volunteered her time to come in and have a little art class and it was great because you know the the resident who had the passion for art came. It drew others that they never did anything like that. Something like who did the watercolors? Who were you talking about doing? Was that you? Know, Sixty or over? You start with the watercolors. Yes. It was kind of like that. So people that had never done that, you know, it was a safe environment they could go into. I was like, oh, I'm going to try this out. And so, you know, they had a chance to try a new skill and. The, the resident with the passion for art had a chance to talk about her experiences and work again. So um, I, I think you see where I'm getting at here. It's that you, you look at the individual and you, and you say, what, what can I build around that because it's still alive. The spark is still there. What can we do with that spark? The National Center has a whole range of free resources to train you how to work. We have best practice <coughs> models that you can use um, and, and going on down the line. At the end of the day, it all comes back to York. We might air everywhere, we might travel everywhere, we might even be from everywhere. But there's no denying that the York art community is an amazing, emergent, dynamic animal that we are shaping as artists and creatives. So how do we continue to do that? How do we create the community, the future that York needs? Set uh, the tone for what we're gonna be doing today. I put these three questions together. We talked as a group about what we wanted to discuss with you because it really should be an interactive session. First, you know, how the big question is, how can we together build a creative, friendly city? What does that look like? And I want you to have that in the back of your head all the way through these presentations. Communities that invest in placemaking efforts, including public art, score much higher in ratings of what they call community attachment. They also found that success in engendering this sort of community pride and loyalty is essential in convincing residents and businesses to invest in their own community rather than looking elsewhere. This willingness and even e eagerness to invest in driving further investment in placemaking is absolutely essential to moving forward this virtuous cycle of a vibrant city. And so the wheel spins round and the community moves forward. If I, in my mind's eye, envision what I do in this community and what I hope for in this community through the work of Downtown Ake and our partners, I think this is what my mind's eye sees, is how do we invest in the landscape how do we convince people that York is the place to be, the place to open a business, and the place to live? And then from that, how to get those folks that we've now convinced to be on our team to add further support to <laughs> keep on moving the city forward? Really working to build this critical mass, which is so important for this type of arts-based revitalization, there needs to be enough that people can say, I'm actually going to go there and spend time there. And it can't just be one thing. It needs to be quite a bit of things. Um, and we need to be drawing large amounts of people into the area as well. And we've been staring at this building for 
a long time, uh, also on the 100 block of East King Street, saying, what do we do with this? It was uh, uh, basically abandoned for five years. Um, so eventually, we purchased this, and um, uh, the question was, what do you do with it that would actually be something that helps drive this economy um, in the community, helps the artists be able to sell their work? And we did a lot of research, and we found the answer is an event venue. Uh, event venue, you have to convince one person and they bring 300. Uh, and then those people, while they're there, they, while they're in the city, they go to the hotel, they go to the restaurants, they buy art, they're, they're in a good mood because they're at a wedding, so they're spending money. Um, and also, uh, uh, a shared workspace, a co-working space, was something else that everybody was telling us that we needed. Uh, we had so many uh, creative entrepreneurs coming to us and saying, you know, I, I need some space. So. Uh, the Union Creative uh, Workspace uh, was part of the development of this building, as well as, um, this is the outside now that it's all lit up and renovated. Uh, so our event venue, the Bond uh, Wedding and Event Venue, this is our grand opening uh, Spring Forward uh, Parliament um, fundraiser. So, uh, so we've really been uh, blessed you know, by a good scenario here where uh, Downtown Inc. is already working to build this arts base foundation and we're able to pick up a good number of properties all in, a, in an area and build a critical mass, which is so important. And we've really been able to do that here in Rural Square. So why aren't families here? Why do we look around and our peers aren't here? Our peers don't know about what's going on here. And uh, attendance was small, projects were small, and we just started researching how can we change that landscape and the culture of the community because there is so much going on from what we've been talking about. You know, we're talking about 20-somethings and empty nesters, bringing them downtown. There's the art scene, the studios, public arts, place making makes it comfortable for people to be here. And then the uh, commitment of the developers is really changing the landscape. So how do we take advantage of that and make people feel comfortable? Create a viable, dynamic, and sustainable destination for families within close proximity to all of this energy um, and make the downtown a more regular part of families' lives, of children's lives, of parents' lives. You saw in an earlier slide that half of the residents of the Central Business District are single. Um, I like to think they won't always be single, right? They're young, they're in their 20s. Eventually, they will grow up and maybe get married and maybe have kids. How do we continue that engagement with downtown? For those of us who care about downtown, we often lament the fact that the county doesn't feel connected to our city. They don't feel responsible for what goes on in the city of York. How can we maintain those connections? Without a downtown, things start to collapse. And there's lots of studies that suggest that the rings around the city start to come apart when the city does. It's important for all of us. So thank you for that because see, that's really important. You can't watch Rachel Ramsey or learn anything about her program, Girls Go Digital, without absolutely falling in love with the idea of pixel mania. Find out more about what Rachel is doing to inspire young girls and whole communities right here. It's really fun and it's a great experience. 
summer, things have gotten a little bit busier. Uh, I've been doing several different projects. I did kind of a private group where I had 25 girls. Two weeks ago, we finished a camp that had 104 girls signed up for it. Um, I think I'm still kind of coming off of that. Um, I've got another camp, a two-day camp at a university just a few uh, miles north of where I am. Um, and uh, we did a project just yesterday in York and hopefully we'll be doing a few more. Um, this was the schedule. It's not necessarily that you, that you read, but for this camp. We had five different groups of girls and we had to rotate them through all these different activities. Um, we had to make sure we had the right teachers, the right classrooms. We had to make sure that we were able to put things in certain order. So we wanted them to have digital photography before they had their Photoshop class, before they had their last web design class so that they could apply those different things and try and build on them. And uh, looking at this, <laughs> it makes me a little bit tired, <laughs> but, but it was really successful. Um, so I'm just gonna show you a few pictures from this last time and kind of go through, I know the time is really short, uh, but these are some of the activities. If you notice, there's Ella on the right hand side. These are tin robots where they used a small motor and a battery and created their own, or engineered their own creation. Um, this paper flashlight project we're gonna be doing at the Martin Library for from 10 to two tomorrow. Um, by learning binary code input output, and then this leads into a project using that makey makey. Um, drawing circuits with uh, electric paint. Uh, we did a project yesterday at the Martin Library. We had eight. Was it eight girls? Yeah where we did um, an e-textiles project. So that top picture, it's taking an, a, an electronic switch and sewing LEDs into it. And, and we, Troy and I kind of talked about it last night, the power of, of when that very first light comes on and they realize I'm making something, but I'm making something that's working. And then they just go, what? I'm, I'm all over this. So it's combining a hands-on tactile technology to to it. Um, this they're using iPads to program these robots. <laughs> so pixel art using little curlers and then designing their own. We talked about how the computer encodes pixels and turns those pixels on and off and how they get their color and then they make something again, it's a tactile takeaway, something that can bring them out of the computer. And then the one that really surprised me is uh, we did a project to build, a, build your own DIY gamer. And um, we had 15 girls doing this project, and only one had ever touched a soldering iron before. And I think there's something like 96 solder points on it. And they totally handled it. We had to cancel one of their other sections because they wanted to do more with it. They were all about it. and. Then what um, it does is it, it attaches to a microcontroller that you can program. You can make your own games or you can make animations. And there was power in the fact that I took, they took my, I, that was a, a slip. There was power when I built it for the first time as well. But um, that taking something that's a bunch of parts and putting them together and it actually works. And then you can start to create something with something you built. So if you look at it, we got our six girls. The second year, 52. And then this last year, 104. Um, exponential, exponential. So what exactly is black art? It's a whole dynamic, incredibly historically rich movement that encompasses visual art, poetry, theater, dance. It's a form of expression shaped by African Americans, but increasingly relevant for all of us today as artists and creatives, both in how the field has grown, emerged, changed, shaped, and adapted based on the culture it's arising in, 
but it's also about how we can take our experiences, our intellectual and our cultural backgrounds, and tell that story through art. You want to know what black art is, and Ophelia is going to help you figure it out. But what is black art? We're talking about, is it the content of the art, or is it the ethnicity of the artist? So the definition of black art, to begin with, is art forms by persons of African descent, representation of black or of black artisan. Black art constitutes a very diverse legacy. You know, after slavery, then we got into the derogatory image, which did not reflect well, you know, these things during Jim Crow. So this is what represented the black image in America. So we're, we're going from some, you know, the, the very creative African artisans pieces to some very negative things, but this is the image in America for black Americans. And, and I, I use this African proverb a lot in a lot of the things that I'm writing and producing because I'm doing a couple of different projects about the black American image. And you'll hear me refer to it a lot as black American as opposed to this good, correct African American because there's a lot that has happened from Africa and when we were first slaves that there's a whole new culture that is a black American that's very different from anything else that happened before that. So it's until the lion writes his own song, the tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. So it becomes this time where now we have to start representing our own image and by our own definition. Um, as indigenous people of the Americas, we're really invisible here. Um, and so thanks, thanks to you all for taking a minute and, and listening to what we're saying. Um, the ownership of our own image and the idea that the work that we're creating, even though we are black or we're native or we're Latino or, or whoever, may not somehow be black or native or Latino or, or whatever it is, is it's, it's crazy to me. It's crazy to me and it comes from a place um, that some of us finally refer to as white privilege. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, um, that means that simply that like, you as, as white folks don't know that this is a struggle we're facing because you never have to deal with it. You're always in the majority and the history of our um, country is your history. Um, and in, in a way it is not. Uh, it's partially our history, but in, told in an inauthentic way. And as a native person, I can, and as a person familiar with Seneca tradition, I can look at that um, piece and see that it is, in a way, about um, Seneca creation story, where in the beginning the whole world was water, and Sky Woman um, fell to the earth from a hole in the sky world, which may be that you know the concentrated spot up here. And so that's the beginning of the Seneca creation story. So for me, when I see that, I'm sure, sure, sure that I see something different than you see, you know, than you see, than you may see. Um, but also the, the powerful part of Marie's work for me is that she does these works with blankets, with army blankets, with reclaimed wool blankets, trade blankets. If you can see this one with the little yellow, green, red stripes, that's a Hudson Bay trade blanket. Um, and for us as Indians, for us as all people, we have stories related to blankets, right? Blankets, they comfort you, they, you know, maybe you had a favorite blanket when you were little and you had to travel everywhere with it. But as Indian people, always in our minds has to be the idea that blankets were a tool of our genocide. When people came here, they filled the blankets with diseases that they had that we didn't have and that we wouldn't survive and they gave them to us so that we wouldn't survive. Because Malcolm and the Muslim movement really heightened our awareness to who we were. <coughs> Prior to that, it was a loss. We really did. But Malcolm was the first guy to say, what's your last name? <coughs> who gave you that name? Where'd you get that name? And I started putting it into context for us. I can remember us sitting around debating, yeah, where did we get this name? People talking about it. How did I get this name? Where, yeah, where did we come from? Because of all the cultures here, even though we know we came from Africa, we don't know where in Africa. We have no real idea. A lot of that stuff is lost. 
So we had to have something to identify that cultural identity was important. It was really important for us to have something to say it was ours. Well, he woke us up to that issue. Maybe not in the way people liked, but he did. He made us think about it. Who are you? Where are you from? You don't even know your name. Do you know who you are? And people started getting real Afrocentric. And I think if people start talking about stuff and feel comfortable with it, it will happen. And, and as far as I'm concerned, my artwork is going to start changing. So I'm, I'm done with black stuff or the African <laughs> stuff. So look for new stuff. But thank you guys very much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. New building is great. Pioneering and adventuring is fantastic. But is there anything really more rewarding than rediscovering that which had already been given up on and seeing it explode with new life? The resurgence of cities, a renaissance movement that we're seeing in York, Lancaster, Harrisburg, all these areas around us here in our viewing area, and hopefully even more. There's a specific science as well as an artistic sensibility to this reclaiming of historically rich, beautiful spaces that just need a little TLC and maybe a bit of art. Art projects can be more than, a lot more than just about art. We heard that this morning in our keynote speech. Now we bring the community together to create positive change. Whether that means learning a new skill set, or meeting someone new, or learning about a different way of thinking, or someone else's perspective. For Union Project, revitalization can be about physical change, it can be about restoring a building, but it can also be about strengthen, strengthening and building ties between people. Uh, and that work never ends. So it, the work we do isn't as much about what we do, it's about how we do it. We bring arts and community together, we build creative solutions, and we take down barriers so people can be involved. I had never even once thought of the arts as an economic or community driver. Neither did my board of directors, most of whom were working class folks from both sides of the street. So we took about six months, and under Stephanie's leadership, we began to put together a little plan that began to define a new direction for our commercial district. A direction that we thought hell's bells were already sunk so deep in the mire, why not give it a try? There was some, I think, skepticism, some outright scoffing. You know, why would artists come to this commercial district? We're not uh, the cultural district downtown. We don't have a lot of resources. Uh, we don't have uh, any really natural assets about the community that we thought artists would be looking for. You know, we're not at the top of a hill somewhere with a beautiful panoramic view of the city. So our, our, our thinking and our focus have, have been so narrow for so long. But we're really good at partnerships in Pittsburgh. There's been a really strong history of public-private partnerships. and. They've evolved from when it was probably the big corporate leaders in the 50s cleaning up the air to um, different kinds of partnerships now. But whatever, for whatever reason, we cross boundaries a lot. And when we cross boundaries, we still run into people we don't know. Um, York has great raw material and local strengths too. So, you know, work from the strengths out. Um, I think people, like Rick said, well, about 20 years ago, 25 years ago, I think the thing that I learned is that it's not going to happen in a four-year political cycle. It's probably going to take a long time, maybe the majority of someone's career, to kind of see some of these projects come to date. It's a program at the intersection of um, the digital and the physical. And so we have created this space where kids are sewing, they're actually doing circuitry, they're doing welding, they're doing all sorts of wild and wonderful things. Um, we've been studying it for five years now. We think it has huge implications for the education system. We see ourselves as a learning lab um, around creativity and curiosity. And we are now in West Virginia putting these make shops in schools um, with really deep professional development. And I always think that, you know, if, a, if somebody comes into the museum and says, wow, I never thought of art that way, then we've done our job. It's all well and good behind a desk or even behind a camera, but nothing beats taking art to the street. Healing communities, growing them, making them a better place to live by taking art 
out to the people. My passion is in social justice and street art. So whenever I talk about my research, and I've researched this for a long, long time, I always like to start out by introducing folks to this artist. His name is D. Craig, and he's from Northern Ireland. And he paints murals like this one you see here. Now he is from a Protestant neighborhood in Belfast, and during, oh sorry, I have some folks who remember the troubles? Okay. Well for those of you who don't know about it, um, his home city of Belfast growing up was a place of really deep social divide. A lot of uh, very violent conflict and many of Dee's friends chose to express their frustrations about the conflict by joining paramilitary groups and picking up a gun. But Dee decided to express his frustrations about what was happening in his city by instead picking up a paintbrush. So in the way that the murals were used as propaganda for the loyalists and the republicans, they can also be used as propaganda for peace and for pushing communities toward what, um, towards healthier futures, where they're not killing each other. Now interestingly, this mural, this was painted by um, a loyalist artist and he said that he heard it was it was there was a replica in a Republican neighborhood that a Republican artist painted, but they had never met each other. And I said, "Do, do you think you'll go find him?" And he said, "No, I, I don't. I don't. I don't know why I would talk to him because he's doing. What, he's like first of all, he's copying your piece, but secondly, he's also a mural artist. He's also interested in this. Yeah, but he's a Republican." So, so I'm, I'm much more interested in deconstructing um, our nationalisms, our fascisms, our um, community-isms um, in a way. Um, so. And every time you see public art, and it can be <coughs> three-dimensional too, consider its potential for creating this incremental and gentle change, or not. People do art for all different types of reasons. Sure, it might be for yourself, it might be for someone you love, it might be because you adore the beauty of what's around you and you just want to express it. But one of the most powerful things about art, of course in my humble opinion, is that art gets to the heart of things. So sometimes it can bypass the mind and actually reach inside you and help you see something, help someone else see something in another person's shoes. Using art for social change, art for advocacy, art for social good, that's using art for its most powerful purpose. I spent a lot of time thinking about social content and how to mobilize social content for social benefits. Um, this is another thing that is heavily influenced by social content. right? A big part of this is that we're taking the social reach of the artists that we're working with primarily through Instagram. And we're trying to kind of sweep the lens over on what, on, on what those Instagram users are seeing, right? So they're used to looking at visual content, they're used to looking at art. Um, we're specifically employing street art. Weirdly enough, one of the really major street artists that we're working with is here. Um, his name's Adrian Andrew, he goes by Gaia. Um, he's an internationally renowned street artist and his uh, social media reaches you know, hundreds and thousands of people on Instagram. Social media is not good for your annual campaign. Social media is really good for, we have 30 students, we have the opportunity to bring them to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, we need to hire a bus, that bus costs $1,000, help us raise $1,000 to get those kids on the bus. Very focused, it's easy to digest, you see a picture with a bus, you understand it. Annual campaign, endowment campaign, things like that, you can't be social for, it just doesn't work. For Instagram, um, we post about three to five pictures to Instagram a week, um, so just like, you think about how it adds up and think about what you want to do. Blog content will take you like forever, right? Like blog content can be something that's like really, really taxing. So it is a total myth at this point that you need to regularly maintain your blog. That is like this weird corporate speak that we got from the early 2000s. My top tip is giving tools and not rules, right? So like the idea of saying, um, here are the tools that we're using, right? Um, we don't like, you can empower people to speak on behalf of your organization. You can give them your Twitter, you can give them your Instagram. I love when I'm working with advisory committees, just giving them pre-populated tweets. Giving them pre-populated, I mean, if you can go and 
pick out 10, 15 square images and just send it to your people. Those are the tools that they're gonna use to be an advocate online, to be a social content advocate for your organization. Give pre-populated tweets, give pre-written blurbs for, uh, for people's newsletters, give images, give tons and tons of images, always watermark them with your brand. Um, but give people the tools they need to become the content, the content advocates that you need to be for your organization. Um, don't say that they have to do it on this day or they have to do it on that day, because social media is social. My social group is different than yours. It's different than yours. I know that they react to different things. So you can't tell everybody on your staff that you have to retweet this on Monday at 9 a.m. You can say, listen, I'd really love you to retweet this, and here are seven or eight tweets that you can use depending on your audience. You're gonna get a lot better, you're gonna get a lot better response there. I love hearing Rachel talk about the concept of disruption. Yeah, we could all keep going along, taking the same smooth path, but that's not how discoveries are made. That's not how inventions are made. It's definitely not how creative adventures are had and dynamic new programs are invented. Rachel Ramsey is just awesome. And what she's done with Girls Go Digital is just awesome. Even if computers and technology aren't your thing, you could definitely learn a lot from her model of take what you love, find a way to use it to help others, grow community, and have a great time. The power of, of when that very first light comes on and they realize I'm making something, but I'm making something that's working, and then they just go, what? I'm, I'm all over this. So it's combining a hands-on tactile technology to, to it. Um, this, they're using iPads to program these robots. <laughs> so pixel art, using little curlers, and then designing their own. We talked about how the computer encodes pixels and turns those pixels on and off, and how they get their color. And then they make something, again, it's a tactile take away something that can bring them out of the computer. And then the one that really surprised me is uh, we did a project to build a build your own DIY gamer, and um, we had 15 girls doing this project. Only one had ever touched a soldering iron before, and I think there's something like 96 solder points on it. And they totally handled it. We had to cancel one of their other sections because they wanted to do more with it. They were all about it, and. Then what um, it does is it, it attaches to a microcontroller that you can program. You can make your own games or you can make animations. And there was power in the fact that I took, they took my, I, that was a, a slip. There was power when I built it for the first time as well. But um, that taking something that's a bunch of parts and putting them together and it actually works. And then you can start to create something with something you built. So if you look at it, we got our six girls. The second year, 52. And then this last year, 104. Um, exponential, exponential. So I've always maintained that um, this is all great. Um, the person who's benefited the most from this is this person. Um, this little girl knows the power of it and um, the power of creating or designing disruptions. And I have my seven girls, but this last camp, this is, these are my girls now. So my sister and her five kids, and if you can see Ada, she's a little bit bigger. My sister makes fat babies. Um, <laughs> so my sister's four daughters, my best friend's three daughters, um, two of their cousins, three of, uh, no, four of my best friend's, friend's cousins, um, my business partner, Rusty, who's on the far left, and her daughter and another friend. So now my group of girls that I want to affect is grown. These are my girls. And um, and that's what's most important. All of this other stuff, the fact that I get to come to York and tell other people about my process and what I've done, it's just so much bonus. I, I can't, I can't um, even begin to explain. Um, 
but there's one thing that I, I just want to to leave with you because I, I don't think that it's be, it's because I have anything that's different or extraordinary. Um, I think it, it's a it's something that everybody has the ability to do. And so I have a, a challenge for everybody here, and especially like artists. Artists have this expression of self and this ability to touch people like other people don't. Um, they, you can use your media to really connect, and that's what's important. So my challenge is to find your passion, what you, where your touchstones are, um, and I want you to design your own disruption that makes sense for your life, and I want you to make an impact. So thank you for taking the time to... I hope you enjoyed our very special behind the scenes visit to the Impact Arts and Culture Conference. Thank you so much to the wonderful people at York College and of course to the dynamic individuals at the Cultural Alliance of York County for letting us get that access. And then also free of charge, bring it to you in your living room. Now, what do we need from you next year? We want to see you there at the convention. We're only able to bring you so much, but there are multiple days of dynamic, exciting information that will challenge you, that will expand your talent, that will expand your reach. You don't even have to be an artist. You just have to be someone who wants to take a more creative look at how you can shape and change the community that you are a part of. Come and join us next year. And in the meantime, make sure to keep joining us here at Culture and Maine. I'm really excited about this. I love the atmosphere. I just want to know more about it. I see it uh, evolving, changing, growing, uh, and I like it. It's fleeting. Once it happens, once a song comes out, once a poem comes out, it'll never come out the same. Some of the culture in Maine is documenting what's going on in a way that will have that lasting staying power. It just breeds healthy growth. It's, it's just, it's a necessity. It, it's, it's, it's a necessity, yes.